cannot do without Him. Jesus is more to me than all the richest, fairest gifts of earth could ever be. But the more I find him precious, and the more I find him true, the more I long for you to find what he can be to you. Did he not die to save you? Is he not all you need? Is he not all? Not long ago, I taught a class for a Southern Adventist University. It was a master's degree class, and it was a class on the book of Acts. We studied the book of Acts chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and the class was an intensive class. We studied three hours a day for two weeks. And the first day of class, I said to my students, on the final exam, there are only going to be two questions. And the students, of course, were excited about that. They clapped. I said, question number one, tell me in detail what's in every chapter of the book of Acts. <laughs> now, you don't have to memorize the book, but if you did, it would be helpful. <laughs> Secondly, tell me how that chapter applies to your ministry. One of the students in the class had previously taken their MBA, and that exam lasted three hours. Well, after writing four hours on my exam, he came back and said, I'd take the MBA exam any day. <laughs> so you would expect me to begin tonight's presentation with a quiz. But I need to give you some background to the quiz that I'm going to give you tonight. A number of years ago, in fact, it was just a couple years ago, Americans were asked a question, and they were given a complete sheet of items to circle. And the question they were asked is, what do you need to get through the day? What's the, mo what's the thing you cannot live without through the day? Now, I don't want you to th think as an Adventist Christian. I want you to take the quiz as if you were an average American. What do you think the average American answered when they were asked, what do you need to get through the day? Coffee. <laughs> number one. What was number two? Chocolates and sweets. What was number three? Social media. Now, here, here are the percentages. 37% of Americans said we need coffee to get through the day, and we couldn't get through the day without coffee. 28% of Americans said we need some form of sweets to get through the day, our chocolate bar, our Snickers bar, our Hershey bar, etc. 19% of Americans said we need cell phone or social media to get through the day. We'd have a social media withdrawal addiction fit if we didn't have our phone. 
a whopping 16% said we need the Bible. Now here was the shocking thing. Twice as many people needed coffee to get through the day as needed the Bible. One third more needed sweets to get through the day. Could the neglect of God's Word by the average American be one of the most significant reasons why we see the moral deterioration in our country? Could the neglect of God's Word be one of the reasons we see this lack of lasting peace, this lack of inner contentment, this lack of permanent joy? Could it be that thousands of people are racing through life, stressed out, anxious, worried, tense, and looking for peace where peace cannot be found? Could it be that they're looking in all the wrong places to calm their troubled spirits? Could it be that just maybe there's something better than a cup of coffee to get through the day? <laughs> you see, worry, anxiety, fear, and hopelessness have led millions of people in our world today to experience major depression that, ex that affects about 20% of the world's population. Now, the World Health Organization predicts that by 2020, depression will rival heart disease as the number one disease in the world. Now, when you take a look at antidepressants, and I am not suggesting that no one ever needs antidepressants, but what I am suggesting is antidepressants are being given out like candy. And when you look at it, we spend about $6 billion a year on antidepressants. In the United States alone, over 270 million prescriptions of antidepressants were sold last year. 270 million prescriptions of antidepressants. That's just a little under one for every American. Now, some, of course, are taking it multiple times. Often, the downside of that is not looked at. 14% of all young people that are taking antidepressants, and the interesting thing is, more and more, the prescriptions for antidepressants are impacting 14 to 18-year-olds. And according to studies by the National Health Organization, the 14% of the young people taking antidepressants are going to become aggressive and even violent. Now, when you add to that problem, there are 140 million alcoholics in our world, 140 million people that have an alcohol dependency. When you begin to look at this, you begin to say, something is wrong in our society. Worry, anxiety, fear, uh, collapsing lives that are falling apart seem to lead people to often take antidepressants or other mind-numbing drugs, alcohol. The general angst in our society, this inner sense that something is not right, that there is little uncertain, there's little that's certain, this fear about the future has created a sense of hopelessness. Now, when we lose hope, the dark clouds of despair hang over our heads. The future appears gloomy. Everything about tomorrow appears uncertain. Uh, but hope leads us from what is to what can be. Hope paints tomorrow in a ray of bright colors. It lifts our spirits from the mud below to the heavens above. I love what Anna Jacob wrote about hope. She said, the wings of hope carry us soaring high above the driving winds of life. Don't you like that? The wings of hope carry us high, soaring above the high, above the driving winds of life. William Shakespeare said this, the miserable have no other medicine but only hope. Now, what is hope? Hope is not some wishy-washy, sentimental feeling or longing for a better future. It's not some baseless desire or an uncertain expectation with no real certainty or assurance. In the ancient scriptures, hope is strong confidence in God. You see, our hope is not in our strength, it's in His. Our hope is not in our wisdom, it is His. Our hope is in the promises of God. You see, our hope is based on the unchangeable Word of God with the certainty 
that the thing you hope for will be accomplished. Now, in his final discourse to his disciples, Jesus gives us three reasons to have hope as the guiding force of our life. He gives us the three secrets of lasting peace. If you grasp these secrets of lasting peace, worry will no, do, no longer dominate your life. I'm not suggesting you'll never have any worry or you'll never have any fear. But what Scripture teaches is you're not going to be dominated by it. It's not going to control your life any longer. If you discover the secrets of lasting peace in John chapter 14, you'll have an inner contentment in your life. You'll have a new hope that buoys up your spirits. You'll have a new sparkle in your eye, new smile on your face. Somebody tonight in this audience is going to grasp the eternal principles of God's Word. Your life is going to be changed. Somebody tonight is going to lay down a burden. There's somebody that has come here tonight with a burden of fear, a burden of worry, a burden of anxiety, a burden of guilt. Somebody has come here tonight feeling anxious and troubled because you keep failing on the same temptations again and again and again. But tonight the light is going to break through the darkness. Tonight somebody is going to grasp eternal principles of God's Word and your life will be forever different. The Holy Spirit that inspired the Bible is going to come, illuminate your mind, you're going to sense a new power in your life. Let's open the Word of God. We're turning to John, the 14th chapter. Three secrets of lasting peace, three secrets of eternal security, three secrets that fill our hearts with hope, purpose, and meaning. We come to John the 14th chapter. And we begin with verse 1, a verse that easily can be read and quickly proceed, and we can easily quickly proceed to verse 2 without allowing verse 1 to mellow in our minds, without turning it over in our minds and fully grasping the significance of it. John 14, verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Now, if I were translating that verse more literally, I would translate it this way. Stop worrying. Lay down your anxiety. Put aside your fears. Why would Jesus say to his disciples, let not your heart be troubled? What has come before in John the 13th chapter that led Jesus to make that statement to his disciples? In John chapter 13, Jesus has just celebrated the Last Supper with his disciples. And Christ has been unusually solemn with them. And they've sensed a seriousness about Christ that they hadn't sensed before. When Jesus broke the bread and drank the unfermented wine, the pure juice of the grape at that Last Supper, the emblems of his blood, when he said to them, I will not drink of the cup of the this uh, sacrifice until I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. This is the blood of the new covenant. They began to sense the shadows of death were hanging over Christ. They didn't fully understand it. There when Jesus said to them, one of you would betray me, they had a sense that Christ's ministry was dramatically turning. Before Jesus lay the farce of a trial, before him lay Pilate's judgment hall. He would be condemned and crucified. He would be stripped to his waist. And the strong armed Roman soldiers would approach him with whip, with the leather whip. And embedded in that leather whip would be bone and jagged metal. And Christ would be flagellated, hands tied above his head. He was going to face whipping, flagellation, the mockery of a trial, ridicule, spitting in his face. He would there carry the cross up Calvary's mountain. His hands would be stretched out on Golgotha's hill. His disciples would forsake him and flee. The Jews there would reject his overtures of love that day. The Romans would crucify him that day. Lightning would flash, the thunder would crash, 
Jesus hanging there on that cross, the divine Son of God, the one that was worshipped by 10,000 times 10,000 angels, the one at whose very name angels winged their way to worlds afar, the one at whom the unfallen world sang, holy, 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 would bear the guilt and shame and condemnation of sin. And the disciples would, would have that last lingering look, at least John would, at least the mother of Christ would, and they would see his broken, bruised, bloody, battered body taken from the cross. And there, that Friday night, there, that Sabbath, they would experience the longest days of their lives. What would Peter do? Would he go back and go fishing again? What would John do? Would he go back home? What, what would Matthew do? Would he go back to the tax collector's booth? So Jesus, to prepare them for what was coming, events that they were not sure about, to prepare them that as the divine Son of God, he would hang on Calvary's cross, bearing the guilt and shame of sin. As Galatians 3 verse 13 says, cursed is everyone who hangs upon the tree. As 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21 says, he who knew no sin became sin for us. They are hanging in agony, bearing the guilt of all mankind. Hebrews 2 verse 8 and 9, he would taste death for all humanity. Jesus must prepare his disciples for what was to come. He must prepare them for the trauma. Is there a crisis coming in this world? Is there a time of trouble coming greater than any time of trouble? Were the disciples going to face a time of trouble that they had not expected in John chapter 14? The disciples were facing a time of trouble like they'd never experienced before. They, were, they would face a sense of aloneness. They would ask the question, where is our Lord before the second coming of Christ? God's people will go through their Gethsemane. They will go through their Calvary. What got the disciples through and what will get us through? Three lasting secrets in John 14. We begin, John 14, verse 1. Let not your heart be troubled. Today, look beyond your worries, look beyond your cares, look beyond your burdens. In the future, look beyond those troubles that burden you down. You believe in God. The word belief there is more than some intellectual belief. In the original language, when it says you believe in God, it has to do with a strong confidence in God, a strong trust in God. What is faith? Faith is trusting God like a friend well known, knowing that He will never harm us, knowing that He holds us in His hand, knowing that He'll never let us go through any trial, difficulty, heartache, experience that He has not prepared for knowing that no matter how high the mountain, no matter how deep the valley, that our Christ can take us through. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. Jesus says to his disciples, whatever you go through, no matter how dark the valley, no matter how high the mountain, no matter how heavy the burden, take the long view. The first secret of lasting peace is this. Take the long view. Look beyond what is to what will be. Take your eyes off the mud below and put them on the heavens above. Cling when the diagnosis is cancer and you're told that you just have six months to live. Cling to the promises of God that this world is not all that we see. Jesus' promise is, I will come again. In my last camp meeting, I met with a man after the camp meeting. He told me about how his 21-year-old son was coming home a few days before Christmas this last year, and his son was in a terrible car wreck and killed instantly. How do you get through that? How do you get through it without casting off your faith? 
How do you get through it without saying, this is not worth it, I give up? How do you get through the trauma of life when you go through the agony of a divorce? How do you get through the trauma of life when your best friend dies? How do you get through the trauma of life when a child is taken from you instantly and you don't expect it? You get that call at 2 o'clock in the morning and your child that's been coming home from college is, is killed by a drunk driver and the drunk driver lives. You can't explain the craziness of life at times. You can't explain why what happens to some people happens. We can't always explain, and any explanation often seems hollow. But this is what we can do. We can cling to the promises of God. Jesus says, I will come again. We take the long view. Life, life is is a vapor. James says, life is a vapor that will soon pass away. You know, the older you get, the more, the more life seems to go by so quickly. You know, I am 74 years old and I've been preaching for 50 years now. And it seems like yesterday when I started, you know you're getting old when you bend over to tie your shoe and you say, what else can I do when I'm down here? You know, you, 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 some of you identify with that, right? Life goes by so fast. And Jesus says, I will come again. 1,500 times in Scripture, the Bible talks about the second coming of Christ. Once, you know, for once in every 25 verses in the New Testament, it talks about the coming of Christ. For every promise in the Old Testament on the first coming of Christ, there are eight promises on the second coming of Christ. We are Seventh-day Adventists. We believe that God created the world at a point in time. We do not believe in the myth and hypothesis of fortuitous chance that this world came into existence by chance. We see all around us the design of a loving God. We also believe that at a point of time Christ entered the world, that he was born of a virgin. And Seventh-day Adventists still believe in the virgin birth. We still believe in the miracles of Christ. We still believe that Christ died for us. We still believe in a literal bodily resurrection that Christ had. We still believe in the high priestly ministry of Christ in the sanctuary above. We still believe in the judgment hour. And we still believe that Jesus Christ is coming again. This is the hope that fuels our hearts. Now notice verse 2. In my Father's house are many mansions. Now, a better translation is many abodes, many dwelling places. What is Jesus saying to his disciples? He's saying, don't you worry because i got enough room up there for you. That's what he's saying. He's saying, let not your heart be troubled. Heaven is not an exclusive place for a few so-called super, super saints who wear holiness robes. Heaven's for you. Heaven's for you. Whatever your past. No matter how many ever times you have failed, no matter what condemnation grips your life, forgiveness is yours. Freedom from guilt is yours. The power of the living Christ to change life is yours. And Jesus says, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. There's one with your name on it. There's one with your name on it. Now, somebody says, look, Pastor Mark, it's wonderful to say, but look, with seven billion people clawing at one another for a living space on a planet called Earth, if I'm not in heaven, God won't even know. If I'm not there, they'll have enough other people there that uh, that's enough. When God created you, when, you were, when the genes and chromosomes came together to form the unique biological structure of your personality, God threw away the pattern. That's why God could say in the book of Jeremiah, when you, when I, I knew you when you were in the womb, before you conceived. You see, we didn't come into existence merely because of some genetic accident, but every life is a divinely planned life. And if God loses you, nobody can replace you. Because you see, when God created you, 
he fashioned in his own heart, only as love can do, a place only for you. And nobody else can fulfill that place. You say, Pastor Mark, that's difficult to understand. Don't worry about understanding it, just believe it. You see, but let me help you understand it a little bit. How many of you are parents? Can I see your hands? Hey, that's great. How many of you have two children? Two children, okay? How many of you have three children? How many have five? Want me to keep going up? Uh, how many have ten? No, okay. Let's suppose you have four children. And one of those children, unfortunately, dies quickly. Maybe they're 11, maybe they're 12, maybe they're 16. And let's suppose you, count, you, you need some counsel. So after camp meeting, the pastor brings you to me after the meeting and say, Pastor Mark, can you counsel me a little bit? You know, I, I've had this child and, 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 you know, I've lost a child. We had four. I still have three. Can you give me some counsel? So suppose my line of reasoning goes like this. I tell the pastor, look, I got this one. I got this one. And my line of reasoning goes like this. Look, I want you to think of all the reasons to be happy. I want you to think of all the reasons to have joy. I want you to think of all the benefits of this. Now, look, now you don't have to send four kids to Cedar Lake Academy, Great Lakes Academy, rather. You can only send three, and you're going to save a few thousand dollars a year because they still charge tuition, and you can go on vacation with that. And think about the clothing money you're going to save, the shoes you're going to save money the, the, on shoes. Think about when you make homemade apple pie, everybody gets now 20% uh, more, the kids, you know. Uh, really, think of all the benefits. What do wise, intelligent Michigan women do for crazy preachers who reason like that? They knock them on top of the head with a rolling pin, right? <laughs> See, what, what, what would you think of that kind of reasoning? You'd say, that's absolutely crazy reasoning. And it is. Why? Because if it were Jimmy that died, nobody can smile like Jimmy. Nobody can love you like Jimmy. Nobody can say, Mama, I love you so much. Dad, I love you so much. See, the love of three for you as a mother, the love of three for you as a, as a father, does not make up for the love of the one you lost. And when Christmas comes, your heart longs for the one that's not there. When Thanksgiving comes, your heart longs for the one that's not there. You look down that table and, and your boy's not there, your girl's not there. The God that placed in a mother's heart, in a father's heart, the ability to love four or five, or six, or seven, that God can love seven billion. He has an infinite capacity to love. And when God created you, just as you are dependent on the reciprocal love of a child, there's nothing that breaks the heart of a parent more than a child that walks away and says, Mom, Dad, I want nothing to do with you anymore. And Mother's Day comes and there's no phone call. And Father's Day comes and there's no card. And Christmas comes and they say, I don't want to be home. There's nothing that breaks the heart of a parent more than a child that does not want their love. And there's nothing that breaks the heart of God more than children that walk away from Him. There's nothing that breaks the heart of God more than people that turn their back on him. Because just as you are dependent for your inner joy and satisfaction and happiness, just as you are dependent on the heart of a boy or a girl, God, when he created you, the infinite God has a place in his heart only for you. So he says to you, Don't let, let, let not your heart be troubled. There's plenty of room in heaven for you. And I'm going to do everything possible for you to be there. Let not your heart be troubled. In my Father's house, verse 2, are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. Now, what does this phrase mean, I go to prepare a place for you? Does it mean that Jesus is a construction foreman and he is telling the, the masons how to lay block for your heavenly mansion? 
Does it mean that he's a construction foreman and that he's telling the angels where to nail the next board? He says, don't be worried. In my Father's house are many mansions. And the incredible good news is in the judgment between good and evil, in the controversy between good and evil, Jesus says, I'm there. I'm there for you. I'm preparing a place for you. Take your Bible and turn to Daniel chapter 7. In this cosmic conflict between good and evil, in this intergalactic struggle between truth and error, in the far reaches of space, God is on trial before the universe. The three angels' message, Revelation chapter 14 says, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come. A rebel angel has said God is unfair and unjust. A rebel angel has said that God wants to exact love but not give love. A rebel angel says that God is vindictive, that He's self-centered. And before a waiting world and a watching universe, Christ hung on Calvary's cross, demonstrating the myth, the folly, the falsehood of Satan's lies. And there on Calvary's cross, before the whole universe, echoing and re-echoing throughout the universe, is God is love, He cares. And in the judgment bar of God, before the coming of Christ, in the pre-advent judgment that began in 1844, the benefits of Christ's atonement are applied to every case, every person that comes to Christ and asks for forgiveness. Jesus stands forth before the universe and he says, this man, this woman is one of mine. And there before the whole universe, Christ says, could I have done anything more to save John or Mary or Harry or Alice? Could I have done anything more? I sent my spirit to their mind. I illuminated their heart. I sent my word to guide them. I sent angels to beat back the forces of hell. I tabernacled in human flesh. Could I have done anything else? We read about it here. Daniel chapter 7. This is more exciting than any Star Wars drama. It's more exciting than any Hollywood fictitious tale. Daniel chapter 7. I watched till thrones were put in place. Here's movable thrones. They are put in place. The Ancient of Days was seated, God the Father. His garment was white as snow, the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated. The books were open. Here, this is a, is, is a drama greater than any Star Wars drama. Thousands and thousands are witnessing this scene. Here is the consummation of the age-long controversy between good and evil. Here is the climax of all of history. And here... Notice what the text says, verse 13. I was watching the night visions. Daniel is overwhelmed. He is awe-stricken with this vision. I was watching in the night visions. Behold, one like the Son of Man. Who is that, everybody? Who is that? Who is that, one like the Son of Man? Jesus. Why in the judgment is the title the Son of Man used? Because Christ came. He tabernacled in human flesh. He faced temptation in common with every human being. He triumphed over the principalities and powers of hell and his life and death up there in heaven. One like the Son of Man, one that touched the eyes of the blind and they were opened and touched the ears of the deaf and they were unstopped and touched the withered man's arm and it was healed and touched paralyzed legs and they jumped and walked again. The one that broke bread on the hillside of Galilee and fed 5,000. The one who walked on water and calmed the storm. The Christ who was here and tabernacled with us and walked with us, He is the Son of God and He is the Son of Man. Notice what Scripture says. It says, I was watching and one like the Son of Man, we can identify with Him and He can identify with us. He came with the gods of heaven to the Ancient of Days. They brought Him near before Him. Verse 14, then to Him, then to Him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, languages should serve Him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away. In the judgment, 
Jesus steps forth and says, could I have done anything else to save? And the whole universe says, Lord, you've done everything you could. And they begin to sing, worthy, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive riches and power and honor and glory forever and ever and ever. And Satan and his evil forces are vanquished. We are saved through his grace, by his grace, because of his grace. Names written in the book of life to remain there forever. And the Bible says in Daniel chapter 7, verse 22. Daniel says, I watched until the ancient of days came and judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High. Judgment is made. Who? Why do we not need to fear the judgment? Because in Christ, through Christ, because of Christ, if we stay with Christ, there's no possibility in Christ you can be lost. I love the way my mentor, George Vandeman, used to put it. He said, when I look at myself, there is no way that I could be saved. When I look at Jesus, there is no way I can be lost. In Christ, because of Christ, there is no way that you can be lost. Unless you make a choice to walk away from His love. Unless you make a choice to turn your back on that love. Because Christ's grace saves us from the guilt of sin and it saves us from the grip of sin. Grace is so good that it not only pardons my past, but it empowers my present. Grace is so good that it not only delivers me from the penalty of sin, but it delivers me from the power or the domination of sin. We come to John chapter 14, and we meditate on those three verses, and we discover the first secret of lasting peace. John 14, verse 1 to 3 don't stop worrying. You believe in God. You have a trust in Him. Place your trust in me. Jesus says, look beyond the trauma of life. Look beyond the heartache of life. Look beyond the sorrows of life. Keep your eyes focused on heaven. Don't let this world squeeze you into its mold because Jesus says, verse 2, in my Father's house are many abodes. There's plenty of room for you. If that were not so, I would have told you. And I'm there in heaven. I am there now after I die, Jesus says, I will be there as your high priest. He says, you can come to me, come to the throne of grace to find help in time of need. He says, I'm preparing a place for you. I will do everything necessary for you to be in heaven because I will be lonely without you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, remember in the trials of life, in the difficulties of life, in the heartaches of life, the sorrows of life, remember that I'm going to come again. So grasp the reality of that promise. Then Jesus proceeds to the second secret of lasting happiness. The first is take the long view, grasp the reality of his coming, and know that he will do everything possible to save you. But then he says to his disciples, yes, I'm going away. And yes, time may pass, and it may seem that it's a long time. But know assuredly, that as your living high priest, my ear is bent low to hear your prayers. The second secret of lasting peace is simply this. We are never far from the presence of Christ. John 14, verse 12, 13, and 14, he moves to the second because he knows that there's going to be this gap between him and the second coming. So he says in John chapter 14, verses 12 to 14, he says, never lose hope. You see, because Jesus is available every moment of the day to give us guidance and direction through prayer. He promises to hear our prayers and listen to our petitions. Chapter 14, verse 12 to 14, most assuredly I say to you, don't you like the word assuredly? What's another word for assuredly? What's another word for that? Certainly, most certainly. What's another word? Assuredly, certainly. What's another one? Definitely. So he's saying, most assuredly, definitely. In other words, this is not if, maybe, perhaps, I think so, or I guess so. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he'll do also. In greater work than these, he'll do, because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I'll do it. So what Jesus is saying is very simple. He's saying to his, his disciples, I'm going to go away, but I'm going to come back. 
but that does not mean you are without my guidance, direction, strength, or power. Because I am your living high priest, and every day as you're on your knees seeking me, I will supply the needs of your soul. I love the way Ellen White puts it here in the book Steps to Christ. You see, Jesus has been reassuring his disciples. He gives them the absolute assurance that he, his ear is bent low. He gives them the absolute assurance that he's with them, that there's never a moment that he's too busy to hear their prayers. Ellen White writes in Steps to Christ, page 100, keep your wants, your joys, your sorrows, your cares, your fears before God. You cannot burden him. You cannot weary him. He who numbers the hairs of your head is not indifferent to the wants of his children. Now listen, nothing is too great for him to bear. How much is too great for him to bear, everybody? How much? Nothing is too great for him to bear, for he upholds worlds. He rules over the affairs of the universe. Nothing that in any way concerns our peace is too small for him to notice. Isn't that good news? Nothing that in any way concerns our peace is too small for him to notice. There is no chapter in our experience too dark for him to read. There is no perplexity too difficult for him to unravel. No calamity can befall the least of his children. No anxiety harass the soul. No joy cheer, no sincere prayer escape the lips of which our heavenly Father is unobservant or in which he takes no immediate interest. Jesus says to his disciples, you're going to be in a battle between Christ and Satan. The forces of hell are going to try to bring discouragement upon you. The forces of evil are going to attempt to overwhelm you. Satan is going to throw every temptation at you possible. He will study the weakness of your character traits and attack you on the place that you're the weakest. There will be times that you'll walk through dark valleys, but Jesus says, first, keep in mind I'm coming again, that whatever you go through is temporary. But second, know that I'm there. I'm there for you in the struggles that you have with the evil one. I'm there for you in the battles that you have with demonic forces. Just before the 2015 general conference session in San Antonio, Texas, I held an evangelistic meeting in San Antonio, to, and uh, we had a marvelous time in that series. It's one of those series we sense the power of God come down, and I'm so thankful for what Michigan is doing and the, and the great, broad, visionary plans that they have to hold an evangelistic meeting. During that series, and one thing about evangelism, incidentally, is you see the power of God come down. You see the Holy Spirit changing lives. Well, during that series, one of our pastors in San Antonio came to me and said, Pastor Mark, there's a woman that's coming to our meetings, and she's coming every night, but this particular woman uh, has accepted Jesus in the meetings. She believes Christ is coming. She had some Christian background before. She's accepted the Sabbath, and she's getting ready for baptism, but there are strange things going on in her home. Uh, at night when she goes to bed, the television seems to go on in these hideous voices, and there is a doors that open in her house, and the door goes back and forth, and uh, it's just a very bizarre situation. Would you be willing to come and pray over this woman? I said, certainly. And I was teaching a class for Southwestern University college students in a field school of evangelism and seminary students, so I said to my students, come with me. So we came. Pastor came. There were four of us, entered the home, and I began to talk to the lady about her spiritual experience, and I said to her, well, tell me a little bit about your walk with Jesus, and she shared it, and I began to go over the major teachings of the Bible. Have you come to Jesus? Yes, I have. Have you given your life to Him? Yes, I have. Do you believe your life is in His hands? Well, yes, most of the time, Pastor. Um, a little flag went up. Um, do you believe he's coming again? We talked about that. Sabbath. Well, she had a little problem. She worked one Sabbath uh, month in a grocery store, but there were other Adventists. Another Adventist worked in the, that store, and he got Sabbath off. So I explained to her how we could write a letter to her employer, and as she made her commitment that we would help her through it and that God would honor her. At the end of my little visit with her, I said, now, is there anything that troubles you, sister? She said, there is. There's bizarre things happening in my home. I said, they're so strange because pictures fall off the wall, 
there is the TV comes on, the door slams, I hear footsteps, and she said, to tell you the truth, I'm absolutely terrified at night. Well, I know this, the more you give the devil quarter, and the more you allow the devil to bring fear to your life, the more he's going to prey upon you. But the more you, you claim the power of Jesus, and you live in the strength of Jesus, the more the devil knows that he has no grip on you. So I began to open the scripture, and we began to read together, and I, I, I read passages like this one in 2 Timothy. We opened the Bible together, and I put my finger on those passages. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7 was one of many that we read. For God has not given us the spirit of fear. And I said to her, now sister, has God given you the spirit of fear? No, pastor. So if God hasn't given you the spirit of fear, where does the spirit of fear come from? She said, it must come from Satan. What does God give you? God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. So a sound mind is a healthy mind, and that's what God gives you. Then I read to her from Colossians, where Christ has triumphed over the principalities and powers of hell. We went to 1 John 4, and we read that perfect love casts out fear. And I said, where are you the most fearful? She said, well, at night when I go in my bedroom. So I said, let's go. So we went into her bedroom, the pastor, the two students, and I. And as they stood, I began reading promises of God. As I read those promises, some things fell off the wall. They almost hit me, and I, I didn't worry about them. I didn't even acknowledge them. I knelt down before her bed. See, often people have to fly on the wings of your faith because their faith is so weak. And I could see this dear sister's faith was so weak. But I believed with all my heart that Christ was present in that room and that he was going to drive out the principalities and powers of hell. I had no doubt about it. I knew because I had been through this. I've been through the battle for so many years. and I've seen God work so many miracles. And I didn't have any question in my mind. And I knelt there crying out to God. And I said, God, God, work a miracle here. God, by your power. And we claim the promise of God because remember what Ellen White says here. There's no perplexity too difficult for him to unravel. No calamity can befall the least of his children. No anxiety harass. And that woman was being harassed. No sincere prayer escape the lips of which our Father, Heavenly Father, is unobservant or in which he takes no immediate interest. So we cried out to God in prayer. At the end, we got up and there was a smile on her face and a sparkle in her eyes and there was a peace in that home. Now, when I walked out of the home, I saw something that I have never seen in my life in all these years. It was the most amazing thing, and I have a pastor and two seminary students that witnessed it. I walked out of the house, and a lady from across the street came running, and she was screaming, and she said, my car was parked in my parking lot, in, in, in my driveway, and nobody was in it. I was sitting on my porch, and the car backed up fast across the street, and I looked, and the car had jumped over the wall of the lady's house in which I was praying. And there was a wall about three feet. The car had jumped over that. The first tires of the car got hung up on the wall. And the car was coming and it was about five feet away from the window where I was praying. And here the car was still going up over this wall on the back of this house. And I just smiled because everybody was tense and I knew I had to bring some sanity, and I said, you know, Jesus cast them out into pigs, and we just cast them out into a car, you know. <laughs> and so, then we prayed that the Lord would send them away totally, you know. So, at that point, I said, now we got to help this dear sister. Her car is hung up, the lady from across the street, her car is hung up on this wall, and you know, it was hot, it was San Antonio, I mean, it was about 102 degrees, and I wasn't going to leave that car up there. So we had to figure out, how are we going to get this car down? Because now it was about three feet above, you know, its back tires are, were over the, on the grass, but the front two tires over the wall. And so I said, how are we going to get this car off this wall? So I, her son by this time came out, and there were some other guys there. I said, look, what do we have? And they said, there's some railroad ties in the back. So take off our suit and ties. We're lugging railroad ties. We built a platform and finally got the car off the wall. But here's the point. Jesus said to his disciples, you may not see me, but I am your heavenly high priest. Prayer is not a ritualistic, formal, rote that we mouth a few words to God. 
But prayer leads us into contact with the Almighty. And as we open our hearts to God, we have a secret of personal peace because we know that nothing can happen in our lives of which He is unobservant. And we know that our life is in His hands. And we know that the power of the living Christ is for us. Three secrets of lasting peace. The first, take the long view. Jesus is coming again. The second, Jesus is eternally present. He's there as our great high priest. But then, Jesus brings this to an end. John, the 14th chapter. He says to his disciples, there is a gift. He says, never lose hope. John 14, verse 18, he says, I'm not going to leave you orphans, I'm going to come to you. In other words, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to you. Chapter 14, verse 26, Jesus says, I am leaving. But the third person of the Godhead, the eternal, infinite, omnipotent, or powerful presence of the Holy Spirit is going to come. John 14, verse 26, Jesus says, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Jesus says, the Helper is going to come, the Helper. Now that word for Helper in the Greek language is parakalitos. Kalitos means to call. Para means alongside of. So the Holy Spirit is the one that's called alongside of us. The Holy Spirit, this parakalitos, is an interesting word. Para, you know, we get parallel bars from that. It's an interesting word. It was used in the Greek legal court system. The parakalitos was assigned to the one in the legal Roman system being tried. They would be their attorney, but much more than their attorney. They would be their defense lawyer, but much more than a defense lawyer. The parakalitos was called alongside of the one being tried to, pr- to provide for their needs. If they needed a blanket in prison, the parakalitos was to provide that. If they needed food in prison, the parakalitos was to provide that. If they needed comfort in prison and counsel, the parakalitos was to provide that. So Jesus uses that term to describe the Holy Spirit. He describes the Holy Spirit as one who is our friend of one who dwells with us and in us, one who will never leave us or forsake us. So Jesus says, I am going away, but I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead. He is your encourager. He will lift your spirits when you're down. He is your strengthener. He will strengthen you when you're weak. He is your teacher. He will guide you when you need wisdom. He is your defender. He'll defend you when you're wrongly accused and often misunderstood. He will comfort you when you need the healing balm for your soul when you're hurting and sorrowful. He will convict you when you go astray and his still small voice will prompt you to duty. He will support you. He'll uphold you when you're about to fall. He's your sanctifier and transform your life into holiness. The Holy Spirit is a parakalitos. He is your helper in times of need. He is the one that will come along your side. The Christian life, we don't simply clench our teeth and grip our fists and say, I'm going to live a holy life and it kills me. In the Christian life, we open our lives to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And the living power of God enters our lives and accomplishes for us and through us and in us that which we never, never could accomplish in ourselves. You know, Matthew chapter 20, verse 20, Jesus says, Lo, I am with you part of the time. Lo, I'm with you some of the time. Lo, I'm with you what? Always, even to the what? End of the world. You know, the great preacher G. Campbell Morgan was giving a Bible study to two elderly women. And he read that, and he said, Lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. He read Jesus' promise. And he said, he was a young preacher at the time, and he writes about it, and he said, Isn't that a wonderful promise, ladies, that Jesus will be with us always, even to the end of the earth? And one of these elderly ladies looked up and said, Pastor, that's not a promise, it's a fact. It is a promise and a fact, isn't it? 
Three facts. Number one, whatever valley you walk through, whatever mountain you have to climb, whatever challenges you have brought to this camp meeting, life is but a vapor. Cling to Jesus' promise, I will come again. That's a fact. He's coming again. Whatever you go through, recognize that there's a place in His heart only for you. And that His ear is bent low to hear your cries and your pleas. That you're special to Him. There's nothing that troubles you that doesn't trouble Him. There's nothing that brings grief to you that doesn't bring grief to Him. Grasp the reality that He's your living high priest. Embrace closely the eternal truth that His Spirit is there to comfort, to encourage, to strengthen, to move in our lives to give us wisdom and strength and power. The year was 1871. And Horatio Spafford was talking to a friend, and he said, I'm on top of the world. My investments are doing really well. Horatio Spafford was a, was a real estate mongol in Chicago. He owned a lot of property on Lakefront Drive and throughout the city. And in 1871, he was doing extremely, extremely well well. But it was Mrs. O'Leary's cow that kicked over a lantern that started the great Chicago fire in 1872. And there Horatio Spafford lost all of his holdings. 1871. He was a wealthy man with a happy home and a happy family. His wife and three daughters. 1872, his fortune was gone. Horatio clung to the promises of God. His wife had a more difficult time. And waves of depression swept over her. Horatio Spafford was a business person who worked with Dwight L. Moody in Moody's evangelism in Chicago. And Horatio Spafford very often financially supported Moody's meetings both with his time, effort, and money. I thank God for business people that have a vision for evangelism. Moody was going to go to London to hold an evangelistic meeting. And Spafford said to his wife, look, why don't we take a vacation in Europe? We still have a few savings left. Then we'll join Dwight Moody in the evangelistic meetings in London. We need to get away from it all. And so they booked a passage on the De Havre. Just before boarding the boat, Horatio Spafford received a message from another businessman that he could recapture some of his fortune and that there were some possibilities. He said to his wife and children, you go, I'll join you. While the De Havre was in the North Atlantic, a British cruiser hit it and hundreds were thrown overboard, and over 200 people died in 12 minutes. Three of those who died were Horatio Spafford's children, his three daughters, drowned in the cold waters of the North Atlantic. His wife clung to a few debris from the ship, was picked up by a rescue vessel, and taken to Holland, and she sent him that telegraph where she said, saved, and saved alone. Spafford booked passage on the next ship, and when they came to the place in the North Atlantic where his children were drowned, he said to the captain of the boat, I, I want to see that place. She came up on the deck, and the captain said, as far as I can tell, it was about here. And Spafford stood in the quietness, looking at the darkness, listening to the waves lap against the boat, thinking about the daughters whom he loved, 
that were in that watery grave. He went down into his cabin and took a sheet of paper and he began to write when sorrows like sea billows roll. Thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Why could he write that? Why in the midst of the deepest sorrow of his life could he write that? He, wrote it, he could write it because he had a sense that life was more than what we see. He had a sense that one day Jesus would come. Why could he write that? Because he knew that in the midst of his deepest darkness and his heaviest burden, that Jesus was there to strengthen and encourage. Why could he write that? Because he understood that through the presence of the Holy Spirit, God was there to give him the strength that he needed. Is there somebody here that you're carrying a heavy, heavy burden? Somebody here that you're worried and troubled? Let's stand and sing that song, It is well, it is well with my soul. Let this song be the prayer of your heart. Somebody battling temptation, let's sing it together. It is well, it is well with my soul. You'll find that on page 530 if you have the hymn note. It's on the screen. It's on the screen as well. Let's sing it together. Peace like a river. And peace like a river. we sing the next verse, there's somebody here tonight that you came into this meeting with a heavy burden. You don't need to leave the meeting with a heavy burden. You can come to this altar. In a conscious decision of your life, you can say, I'm laying that burden down. There's a place in heaven for me. Jesus is here to hear my prayer. The Spirit is here to comfort me. When we sing I have a special appeal for three groups of people. If God touches your heart, you just come. Forget about this audience and talk to Jesus. It would be a shame to come here with a heavy burden and leave with that same burden. It'd be a shame to come here worried and troubled and leave worried and troubled. Jesus says, peace I give you. My peace I leave with you. I long for the Spirit of God to come down and touch someone. There may be somebody with a burden, come and lay it down. There may be somebody who's drifted away from Christ and you hear the call of God and you want to come back. There may be somebody that's struggling with some decision that you have to make. However the Spirit impresses you, if there's something in your heart, a burden that you have, a worry that you have, the temptation you're facing, but be very specific with God. Come and talk to him specifically about that burden. Come and talk to him specifically about that temptation. Come and talk to him specifically about that decision. And God's going to touch you. You just come right now here, and then I'll pray over you. Let's sing together. Sing the second verse.
And Lord, haste the day. Let's sing it together. And Lord, haste the day. Faith will be sight. And my faith shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The drum shall resound. And the Lord shall be sent. Even so, it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well. It is well with my soul. Jesus knows the burden of your heart. He is lifting that burden right now. He knows the struggle that you may have been facing. And right now, he's going to give you strength. He says, come unto me. Is there somebody else that you want to come right now? I'm going to pray. If you want to come, just step out into the aisle and come if you want to come. Let the Spirit of God speak to your heart. If you need that peace that only he can bring, you come. If you need that power that only he can give, you come. If you need that comfort, you just come. You just come now. It's in the quietness that Jesus speaks. Not always in the bombastic loud music, but in the quiet hymns. In the quietness of a meeting like this, God touches somebody. The Spirit of God comes down and moves on their heart. A revival breaks out in that person's heart and mind. People come and they lay down their burdens. Jesus says, him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. Him that cometh to me, whatever the past, tonight's a new beginning. Whatever the burdens, he's lifting them. Peace he's giving to you tonight. We're going to pray just now. Oh, my Father, men and women, and boys and girls have come to this altar. And Father, in their behalf, I am seeking you tonight. They have come to lay down their heavy burdens. Father, I pray just now that I believe in Jesus' name you have said, peace I leave you, my peace I give unto you. Father, fill hearts with peace just now. Give them a sense of your eternal presence just now. I thank you, Father, that this is not some kind of religious game, but that you are real, that you're placing your arms around men and women here tonight that you're whispering words of hope through your Holy Spirit and encouragement in their minds, that tonight you will grant to us your strength and your power, that tonight, for tonight, many of us, it is a new beginning and a new start, that you have promised to come again and take us home, that there's a place in your heart only for us, that your ear is bent low to us, that the Spirit is there to encourage us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus that we can leave this altar knowing that our hand is in your hand, that our life is hid with Christ in God. Thank you that you're coming again for us. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Go in the name of Jesus. Go with the peace of Jesus. Go knowing that you are his.